In today's stream and the first unofficial episode of the esports creative cast with NOAC Design, we interview graphic designer Owen M. Rowe. Owen is a young, industry-leading esports creative behind the iconic visual language over at the incredibly well-known organization, Evil Geniuses. We'll talk about the esports creative scene and how to make your way to the top of the industry and work for some of your favorite organizations. So we have Owen. If you don't know who he is, currently he's working for Evil Geniuses. He's a very well-known designer in the esports industry, and he has very, very stellar work. And I'm sure most of you know who he is, but, you know, today we're going to be diving in to a little bit more about his story, his advice, and all that good stuff, right? To start off, I think what makes the most sense is to ask you, when you started, where you started, and why you started doing all this in esports. Yeah, so I mean, when I first started, uh, I was only like 13 or something. I was in seventh grade. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was really a conscious decision to be in the esports community, which I feel like is kind of uncommon. I feel like a lot of people just find their way here through like, either Fortnite or the Call of Duty community or something. Um, but at that time, up until then, uh, I had been playing Roblox. I was a Roblox player, so uh, pretty interesting. But unsurprisingly, I got tired of that pretty quick. Uh, and you got to keep in mind, I was like 12 or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but in like 2016, that's what year this was. Um, 2016, uh, at the end of my seventh grade year, was when I decided to really pursue designing. And I chose the esports community in particular because I just recognized that there was so much uh, really just good talent there. I hadn't really been exposed to that kind of environment before. So I just took the plunge. I had a friend in here. He was kind of in like a COD team, but not really. Uh, so I, I was in the COD community, maybe. It kind of depends. On your definition, I guess. I was in like two COD teams and none of them were very relevant. Um, and I've never been in a team like Obey or Soar or anything like that. Mm. So I have virtually like no connection to the OG COD scene. I literally just came here because I I guess I just wanted to be a part of it, you know? There's so much opportunity and I could see where it was headed. And I just took advantage of that, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it seems like the story is actually pretty similar for a lot of people where you start into some some area of gaming. Like I know when I first uh, started playing video games was in early high school, Black Ops 2, when it first came out with my friends. And then it's just something about the design community and the creative scene that just draws you away from like, you know what, maybe I don't need to be playing video games all the time. Like this kind right. of this design creative stuff is actually super super interesting to me so it's cool to hear the the early beginning also to point out how young you were when you started and how how old are you now i'm currently 17 i turn 18 in march that's insane so that's that's also really really cool to see that um you know a testament to being young successful creative it's totally possible you know i always say that age is not a um huge factor when it comes to getting hired in this type of industry so it's uh hopefully you feel similar way and i mean you're kind For of a, sure. uh, the living story of that right so mm -hmm. i guess that being said if we move on to the next question then we got a little bit of history from you but i also wanted to know what your first major organization was that you worked under and how that experience was different compared to freelancing or just working on your own well, my first major organization was actually Epsilon, which is like a French org. You don't really hear about them much nowadays, but they were like tier two at the time or something. So it was a pretty big like step forward. Um, and I joined Epsilon like like eight months after I started designing. So it was like really early on. Uh, and frankly, I don't know what they were doing picking people like me up because they're a French org. They work in France. They speak French. Um, and I was in like a different time zone. I wasn't particularly good. Um, so it was not the uh, the best position to be in, I guess. But it gave me a lot of good experience. And really, that's what matters, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but 
I mean, compared to freelancing, I guess freelancing was better. I wasn't getting paid mm -hmm. at Epsilon. Uh, but frankly, that's not what I was after, you know. I was, again, like 13. Yeah. Um, and so, to me, it was amazing that as like an 8th grader, <laughs> which is what yeah. I was at the time. I was in 8th grade. I was in middle school uh, when I joined Epsilon. Mm -hmm. And I was just happy to be there, you know. To me, it was like a rung on the ladder that I had to climb before getting anywhere else. And to be honest, I do think it worked a lot in my favor. But I did end up, because I left Epsilon. Mm -hmm. pretty quick i wasn't there for long um but it was like my first entry into the real deal esports scene and it was like my third team ever or something so like there was like the cod team my friend was a part of some other random cod team that i don't remember and then epsilon uh which i mean that was my only real like resume piece you know that was like the only thing i could put mm -hmm. on there so i think it worked out you know I don't really advocate working for free, but if you're in eighth grade, yeah, um, it kind of makes sense. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. So I guess in that sense, you were kind of saying that at that time freelancing was a better gig for you in that specific mm -hmm. moment, right? So this is kind of a curveball. This is not originally one of the questions I had lined up, but I was also curious compared to that job where you're working for free to a job like Evil Geniuses where you're obviously getting paid now. Um, I guess, how's that experience in comparison to the other things you mentioned, right? Oh, it's like night and day, man. Mm. Like I would so much rather, even compared to freelancing, I'd rather work for an org, mm -hmm. uh, which might even be somewhat of a controversial opinion. Like I know some of my friends would disagree with me on that, but I just love, with an org, you kind of work. It's like an iterative process. So mm -hmm. you go from one project to the next and you can kind of build off that each time. Whereas with freelancing, it's like you're starting over each time. Um, and I feel like I just perform the best in that environment. And also the money's nice. Uh, I like having money as I think most people do. Mm -hmm. uh, so compared like Epsilon versus EG, it's not even close, you know? Mm -hmm. EG has more talent. It has more income for me. It's more fun. I'm surrounded by people I'm more like familiar with and they're just, you know, they're, they're higher potential. Frankly, I like, you know, they're successful people. I admire them. It's great to be around them. Mm -hmm. Um, and you don't really get that when freelancing, I'm not saying freelancing is like worse than working mm -hmm. at an org, but if given the choice, I would rather work at an org. Yeah. Yeah. And in my experience is all based on your personality and the type of stuff you that you enjoy working under. So like freelance, obviously you restart every time you start a project. It's completely new. You're working with a new person. You have to get a read on who they are. And it can be very refreshing, but also very exhausting. Whereas mm -hmm. I think kind of as you were alluding to is for working under an organization, you get to grow with these people. You get to build this singular brand. You know, if you work right. for them for a year, that year you've learned about the type of stuff that they like, this type of stuff that works and doesn't work, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So if you really enjoy the idea of just building, then I usually recommend that people go for esports organizations rather than freelancing, right? For sure. Yeah, so definitely in agreement with you there. And um, I think also to add to that, going into the next question, I wanted to ask what some of the steps were that you took to climb your way to the top of the industry right now and how you made yourself stand out from other creatives in the industry? Uh, well, obviously it started with Epsilon um, for the most part. That was my first entry. Um, but like I said, after that, I actually freelanced for quite a while too. I went like probably a year or two just doing logo clients because that made the most sense for, you know, like, my options were get paid a hundred dollars a month at like a low tier esports org or do a hundred dollar logos. And I could do like, who knows, like 15 in a month, you know? Mm -hmm. So to me at the time, uh, that made more sense. So I didn't have like a linear progression where there was like an upward graph of my, I guess, position in the scene. It was kind of me just bouncing all over the place, but the general trend was upward. And I think that's what matters more. Um, mm -hmm. So aside from Epsilon and the freelancing, I I think my f second major esports experience was probably in Cyclone. 
which yeah. uh, <laughs> is not a particularly big <laughs> team by any means. But, uh, you know, that's that's just what you got to do. It's a matter of climbing the ladder. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually co-led Cyclone as lead designer with Arya. Um, and Arya, I know he's been on the show before, Arya Manzuri. Mm -hmm. um, I met him in like 2017, I want to say. Uh, also Desmond Co. And it was like kind of us three. We had this unit formed. Mm -hmm. um, I guess like a friend group, you know. But we'd work together and we'd kind of climb the ranks together and all that. Uh, and so Ari and I were in, we were in Cyclone and also some other org. It was like called In Control or something. They're also, mm -hmm. they're smaller than Cyclone. Um, but I think that really goes to show how like humble our beginnings were. Because Ari works at Dignitas now, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we both started at these like random, like no name organizations and it's just a matter of building the resume um and then obviously much later on in like 2018 uh i was in denial esports mm -hmm. uh which was <laughs> an experience yeah i've heard um, stories <laughs> yeah yeah uh maybe you read in the news that i was fired um by zach the ceo who is uh an infamous figure in the scene Mm -hmm. um that whole thing was you know there's a big drama because i said someone made like a fan remake uh for enigma 6 and uh, mm -hmm. like their logo they made a it was like you know they just made a logo redesign for e6 um and posted on twitter and i'm like yeah this is cool dude um and i don't this is such a strange story i'm kind of getting off topic here but mm -hmm. i point is i ended up getting fired because i i complimented this logo remake yeah and the denial ceo and the enigma 6 ceo were in like a hoots it was this whole weird thing mm -hmm. um but that also goes to show like esports is not you know there's there's not like a defined standard for it yet it's not totally fleshed out so you get situations like denial sometimes and that's just that's okay you know um i don't regret my time denial but after denial i went to evade which was a weird choice that shocked a lot of people because it was just like a fortnite content team um, but the reason I went to Evade is because I, you know, Hantau, who owns Evade, uh, like I genuinely believe that guy is super smart. And he had a vision for Evade. He was going to take it from just a shitty low tier Fortnite meme team uh, to like a real deal esports organization. And I believed him and I still do believe him because he did it. It's now mm -hmm. Overtime Gaming. It was acquired by Overtime. And... I could see that in him and in Evade as a whole. And I was, I really did trust his leadership. And so that's why I joined a team like Evade, because I knew it was going to be more than that. Uh, a lot of people thought Evade would be something like, it'd be like analogous to like Dare or like mm -hmm. Lucky Seven or something, if you want to get old school with that. Yeah. Um, but it isn't, you know, I, I could see the writing on the wall for what it was going to be. Um, and so. That did work out because now it's overtime and I was correct in mm -hmm. my predictions, I guess. Um, and in trusting Hantau's leadership. Um, so that helped buff up my resume for when I obviously applied to EG, um, which I, I found off Twitter, by the way. Mm -hmm. So my, <laughs> most yeah. of my jobs previously, I had some kind of connection there or something. Uh, EG was not the case at all. I literally just saw a tweet that said they needed designers and i just applied um so sometimes life is just that simple you know yeah uh, <laughs> and uh i wouldn't have gotten that job unless i had that resume built up and i had spent i mean i guess years doing that and this whole time by the way too that group with desmond myself and aria in it that had kind of evolved to now include people like max chan and uh carter mcmullen and that kind of spread out into this larger thing and now we were all in these orgs together and now obviously that, that coalesced into the gameosphere nowadays yeah uh, which you know you're aware of i don't think chat's aware of it but yeah that's fine. It, it's that like a, a cool chat with cool people basically right um, yeah yeah that's the best <laughs> way a cool chat with cool yeah. people but I, so yeah i i guess mm -hmm. kind of to summarize your thoughts then is because the question was what made you like climb your way to the top and how you were able to stand out from other creatives. It sounds like 
what you did over time, over years, it was like a very slow process. You just tried out a lot of new things. You took some risks with these organizations, some that, you know, you, you, you saw like a vision in most of them that you wanted to roll with. Right. Right. Um, and taking those risks and obviously having your friends along the way is kind of what helped you separate yourself from other uh, people, right? Just being willing mm -hmm. to like, you know, I'm going to try working for these people. I trust these people, you know, and I'm just going to, like you said, climb the ladder, work your way up to the top, right? For sure. Just, yeah. uh, you know, slow and steady wins the race type of deal. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I feel the exact same way about my story as well. So uh, it's cool hearing your end of that. But um, I think moving into the next question, this one I'm actually very curious about is where you find your inspiration and overall what your biggest influences have been in your career. Well, um, I think I'm, I don't want to say artistically inclined, uh, but I, I do pay attention to, uh, I guess, just like, media and art stuff in general like before i was even a designer um i really like this game called hotline miami which is it, it's like a very like retro uh synth wave outrun type of game and i kind of latched on to that aesthetic even in my room right now i got like pink and blue lights mm. um that's because that's like my that's where i started out kind of uh i that's how i started exploring i guess like the art world you know like vaporwave type of stuff um and that kind of, because to me, when I think like inspiration, it's not just design inspiration. There's like other art out in the world that influences my aesthetic mm -hmm. um, for like, you know, you can see that in like my personal branding or whatever too. Um, so like Blade Runner is another big one. I really fucking like Blade Runner. Mm -hmm. um, shows like Evangelion and Gundam. I fucking love those too. Yeah. <laughs> uh so yeah i know there's a lot of gundam fans in the community i know pressure's out there oh yeah um i don't know if he's watching this but you know i'll make uh, him watch it yeah <laughs> <laughs> classic uh local gundam fan mm -hmm. um and then also just in terms of like literal design um i mean i don't know there's like certain people i feel like right now in the last month or so in particular i've explored a lot more like named designers like mm -hmm. people from outside esports that are just like famous i want i don't want to say famous because they're not really famous but like known mm -hmm. designers like uh i guess known in the industry yeah or whatever um and uh so people like uh dan barkle i think is his name yeah uh he made he did a collab with fanatic recently uh and i i really really liked it Mm -hmm. but that's just one example of like i don't really i don't collect inspiration from designers in particular more so than i do it's 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 a matter of finding like groups of inspiration so like uh obviously there's like behance which is good don't get me wrong um but i am always of the opinion that pinterest is probably the best way pinterest. to find new inspiration and that people mm -hmm. don't understand what i mean when i say that but pinterest is like google images if it was curated for your design taste and it just showed you it, you didn't have to type anything in, it would just give you it. And to me, that's like super powerful. You can just go on Pinterest if you want to design something and instantly get stuff to look at. It's perfect. Um, and also Instagram too, obviously. That's how I discover people like Dan Barkle. Mm. Um, you know, I think that goes without saying, uh, but as soon as you start looking beyond the esports world, you will be better. Like it's it's that simple. If you're making if you're aiming to make good esports graphics, don't aim to emulate esports graphics. You should emulate other graphics. You know. Yeah. Um, and I think that's that's a thing that I wish more people understood because you get these very repetitive, or I guess I should say derivative, mm -hmm. these derivative designs, um, which all look kind of vaguely similar, and it's I think that's because. The esports design world is so insular. Uh, it doesn't really look outwards that much. Um, so I try to break that as much as possible. Yeah, totally. And I, I really love how you answered that. I was actually going to make a follow-up question on maybe where people can find inspiration themselves, but it seems like you answered it pretty well. Uh, Instagram, 
Pinterest is great. Like you said, Behance is all right. But basically the main point is branching out of what you're seeing on Twitter from these esports graphics already and finding a way to take these. I mean, even it, like movies, TV shows, you know, any sure. anything where you can just pull from that style and slowly integrate it into your work is uh, super, super important for the industry we work in when it comes to separating yourself, right? Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, awesome. I, I was super interested because I know you put a lot of like research into outsourcing um, inspiration, stuff like that. So that, that was a great answer. But um, here is the question that I think a lot of people are probably hoping I would ask or something similar to it. But obviously, anyone who knows you on Twitter knows that you have very strong opinions about things. And specifically in the esports world. So I wanted to ask you if you had any advice for other people when it came to sharing their own opinions on social media and Twitter and stuff like that. Okay, I really like this question uh, because it allows me to address this problem (laughs) without it coming out of the blue. Um, But I guess I'll start with, so my personality, I feel like I'm pretty assertive. Once Once I figured something out, and I know it to be correct, it's almost difficult for me not to like impose that on other people. Mm-hmm. But it's not like a malicious thing. It's just like, I know we can be doing better than this. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, you know, ultimately the goal is to help people out. Um, knowing myself, uh, if someone comes to me and is like, man, that fucking sucks, dude. <laughs> Like, <laughs> I'll be like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Well, what would you do about it then? Because, like, obviously something's wrong if it's getting that strong a reaction, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but if someone's kind of, like, low-key about it, like, hey, maybe you could change this. That's, you know, that's more of a suggestion, not not so much an alarming failure of my ability, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how I view it. It's almost like that's what I would do to myself. I would be that strong with myself. But obviously I understand uh, not everyone's going to be that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and some people interpret it differently than others. And it's really a matter of just, um, I guess, delivering it in a way that isn't totally abrasive. So there's like the, the I want to say it's like the the criticism sandwich. The or compliment, compliment, compliment sandwich. Compliment sandwich. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's like you started off with positive feedback, mm-hmm. put the critique in the center, and then end it with positive feedback. Um, that works. I would recommend doing that. Um, Obviously, I don't know if I can truthfully say I practice what I preach in this mm-hmm. regard. Um, so I would probably say don't do what I do. <laughs> but if you're gonna, if you're like me and you almost feel like you have no choice, like you have a moral obligation to say something, mm-hmm. then probably figure out a way to do it that isn't totally insulting. Yeah. That's what I would say. Yeah. And I think that this goes back to this idea of personality. And there's a lot of different ways you can go about, uh, especially when it comes to critiques, um, whether you're super friendly or super harsh. Um, that's mm-hmm. why, I mean, the, the I guess, pre-title of this stream was you either love him or you hate him. Um, mm-hmm. Because, I mean, I think in this industry, people are, I mean, since a lot of people haven't received a formal education in design. Anyone that goes to university for design gets super tough skin because these professors are like, they're, they're sick of this shit. They've been, they've been teaching for 20 years and they're not going to sugarcoat anything. Um, like they hate these dumb kids. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) exactly. So like, I remember my professor, uh, my typography professor, me young was, I mean, she was, probably one of the older uh, if not the oldest person on the staff for the design program Um, super strict Asian woman Um, she would tear you down you would be scared to put up your work on the wall to get critique but at the same time typography I would say is probably my strongest suit at this point um, Mm -hmm. in what I'm capable of and it's all because of that harsh criticism and it's like you said it's all coming from like good intentions and uh, if if you can really have a conversation about those types of critiques and you see yourself getting better from it, then, you know, by all means, I think that's probably why you and I get along really well. Um, because we know it's, it's not too hard if we have something to say, right? Yeah. I mean, I really do think, uh, like for me, I think people, 
misunderstand me sometimes when they, they they think they could come in and just be like, oh man, that's what if what if he heard someone say that about his work? You know, mm-hmm. it's like, do it, dude. Like, yeah. you know, it's not the first time, man. Like, that's fine. Mm-hmm. You know, my friends say that. I'll tell my friends that. That's just how it works. I want to hear. Well, I don't want it. Nobody wants to hear that. Yeah. But if I have to hear it, I have to hear it. You know, and that's just that's fine. Um. And I, I come in conflict a lot with like <laughs> the Call of Duty community and stuff because mm-hmm. um, they'll hear me say so. I'll so, like I'll even just breathe in their direction. I'll joke about COD designers and they'll jump yeah. on me. And I don't blame them. I don't blame them. Uh, they are the butt of many many jokes. Yeah, uh, I'd get mad too. Um, they have every right to attack me. Mm-hmm. But uh, in the end, I know that my criticisms are are valid at least. Um, they don't they don't make an effort to refute them Mm -hmm. which is i find that interesting you know um so in the end it just comes down to me like they either gotta face it or they just won't improve like i don't know what to tell them it's that simple you can't get mad at someone for for criticizing you at the same time though there is a good quote um and it's something along the lines of like don't don't take criticism from someone you wouldn't get advice from or something mm. like that. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, of course there's the, you just got to listen and improve half the conversation, but there's also the, you need to listen and improve from reliable sources. So I don't, I don't blame them. It's just a, I think it's a misunderstanding of who is and who isn't reliable. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's a um, great answer. And I was really excited to ask that one. And I, I feel like a lot of people are kind of the same way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's really what you're trying to do is unveil some layer of truth. And based on your personality, it's going to come out a certain way. Um, I would say that I, I know a lot of people would maybe say that the community is soft when it comes to receiving criticism. But I would maybe even reword it as um, the community hasn't been taught how to receive criticism because most right. of us are self-taught and it, it can feel like a personal attack, especially if you're a newer designer, creative or something like that. So um, for sure. I mean, I totally get it's like a piece of you. you yeah. Know? Yeah, exactly. So, so it makes sense. I don't blame them. Totally yeah. fine. Uh, but I definitely think that's one thing that we should try to build in 2021 is figuring out how to take critiques the right way and actually learn from them and stuff like that. Cause it is a skill um, not only providing critiques, but receiving critiques and knowing how to do that is a skill in its own. So um, for sure. Yeah. I guess moving into some extremely strong opinions, maybe um, I wanted to ask what your favorite and least favorite parts are about working in the esports industry as a creative. Okay. Well, I mean, favorite parts, I guess I'll tackle that first. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is a lot to say about, being a designer in esports, you know, it's, I think people, well, I don't know. Some people don't seem to understand the position they're in and we really got to take a minute, just be grateful that we're here, you know, like this is a, we're on the forefront of a brand new industry under normal circumstances. Someone like me being only 17 would not have the ability to climb the ranks like this. It's, it's just new enough to allow us to, easily advance within the scene but it's just mature enough to have money and talent flooding in and it's kind of in like the golden zone right now Mm -hmm. um so i guess my favorite parts are really just being able to be here at all and work on these big projects and meet all these people and have these connections like these are these are people you'll you never know when you're gonna need to message them or maybe you have a business offer or something there's always some way, like life works in mysterious ways, you know, um, and you never know how this is going to come back around and have a positive impact in your life. Even when you've left, just knowing the people that are here right now, I mean, they're everybody here is, for the most part, pretty damn smart, you know, mm-hmm. like a lot of people here, we don't, we don't end up here by coincidence or chance, you know, um, It takes a lot of commitment to climb the ranks like this and once especially once you start getting into the tier one level of esports like those people you know are like the real deal at that point they're like world-class talent 
mm-hmm. you know? So you just like, even if you don't like them, you got to admit that they are here and that's going to work out. And it's, yeah, it's good for all parties involved. There's, mm-hmm. there's another quote. It's like uh, 80% of success is just showing up. Um, yeah. And that's honestly true. That's honestly true. I, I firmly believe that just being in the community period that alone is valuable and i think people take that for granted sometimes and you know it's easy uh but i feel like if you could very easily walk out of this community Mm -hmm. and only in retrospect would you realize what you had because who knows where we'll be in 10 years man like i don't it's i literally cannot predict it there's no saying where we'll be. It, maybe it won't exist. Maybe there will be a bubble that bursts. Mm-hmm. But either way, those people you met will go on to do great things. And the fact that you you know them or have that connection, the importance and the value of that cannot be overstated. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess I'll move into least favorite things now. So the inverse of this, though, is that with all this money and talent coming in you know maybe there's like non-endemic people who don't really know what they're doing all that much and they're kind of just like bureaucratic like they don't really have an understanding um and they're there just to fill a slot in a Mm -hmm. company's like hierarchy and they're just awful to respond to and like if they're your boss you're gonna and if if your boss you don't like them and I mean, there's a pretty good chance, like if you're if you're a self-taught designer and you have some like investment firm, like goober that was planted there, like obviously that's going to suck, you know, mm-hmm. um, but that's what you got to deal with. And either way, you should still be nice to them. You should help them, you know, like figure it out as they'll do you because they also know things you don't. And you got to keep that in mind. So even if it's a pain to work with them at first, um, they're they they're probably thinking the same about you because mm. at the same time you're just some goober who self-taught yourself photoshop or whatever you know uh so it's important to be self-aware but at the same time that is a problem that if you're working these sorts you probably will run into and that's fine you just gotta you gotta tough it out you know um sometimes people's visions won't align with reality uh and i mean that's okay you know, you just got to do what they, what makes, ultimately you got to satisfy your superiors, basically. That's really what yeah. it's a matter of. Yeah. I, I, and I think normally how I summarize it, um, based on like the two sides of esports is the best part about esports is that it's new. And the worst part about esports is that it's new. Um, yes. <laughs> because it's like you said, there's so much opportunity. I mean, you're not, you're not seeing creative directors outside the industry who are like in their twenties, you know, like you are in mm-hmm. esports. Um, for sure. There's just so much room for growth, and it's honestly like when I look at esports, I think of like Bitcoin, you know, where it's like yeah, if you were yeah. in when it started, you're like you're chilling now, like you're rolling in it. And even now, I say, what what is Bitcoin at? Like what twenty? I think it's at like thirty grand. Right thirty now. grand. So yeah. when I I think of esports, I think right now. If we compare esports to Bitcoin, esports in the industry is in like the nine to ten thousand dollar range. If even that, maybe it's just in the three totally. to four thousand dollar range. You know, I completely agree. Yeah. yeah, that's a great analogy. Like if you were in back when it was ten cents, and it's three thousand dollars now, you're chilling. But it's still mm-hmm. even as it is right now in 2021. If you hop in now. Um, you could still see some really great benefits in the long run, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, those are, I, I mean, I'm complete agreement with both those points, both those sides. I think people feel the same way about esports. So, I guess to transition into the next question, I was curious what direction you saw esports or see esports moving in the future? Yeah, well, I mean, I think this kind of builds off. The previous question a little bit i i think it'll be more exclusive in the mm-hmm. future to be honest because there will come a time where i mean if you think about traditional sports obviously that's that's not completely analogous to esports mm-hmm. uh, but it's the closest thing we have to work with so in traditional sports i would not be able to 
get to where I am. I mean, maybe, <laughs> I, don't, I guess I'm not really sure. I just mm -hmm. don't see that happening. There's not a community structure in place where it facilitates the growth of super young, uh, I guess, I don't want to limit it to designers, but super young designers. Mm -hmm. um, and I would never have been able to get to where I am now. Um, so I, I really do think it'll be it'll be more exclusive. There'll be more money. It'll be bigger, you know, yeah. that, but that just seems obvious. Um, and, and I mean, really, my point is that to go with the Bitcoin analogy, this is the time to buy in, you mm -hmm. know, like this is really if you have your resume now, if you have. So you had Envy on your resume from like 2014. Mm -hmm. In 2020, having Envy on your resume is way more valuable than it was back then, you know? And, oh, yeah. and that's only going to continue to be the case. Like Envy 10 years from now, who knows? Maybe it won't exist, but in all likelihood, it probably will. And it'll probably be bigger than it is now. And even if it doesn't exist... The most of the, I don't want to say most, I guess it's a pretty bold prediction, but mm -hmm. there will be esports teams that are far more valuable than Envy. Um, and if you, if you get in on that early, I mean, you know, that's like a free ride. Like you're, the industry right now really is just, it's immature, but it's growing up. Mm -hmm. And uh, that window's closing. I don't know how long it'll be open, but even now, like, the design community right now compared to two or three years ago, which is not that long of a time, it is so much more mature and developed than it was even just a few years ago. And I think that's like a symptom of just more, I mean, esports teams are just, you know, they're, they're making more money, you know, that has, it has more direction. I feel like uh, for a while there, we were just emulating sports teams with like mm. franchises and yeah. stuff. Um, and I, I don't think that's probably the long-term direction of esports. I, I really don't think esports will be localized. I don't think there's, there's no such thing as a fucking Chicago esports team when they operate out of Texas. Like, come on guys. No one, <laughs> no one gives a shit about the location. This is the internet. Okay. We should not be emulating physically. Like this is not analogous to sports. We should be carving our own path. Um, and I think that's really that's really my two biggest points here. It, it's young, but it's growing up. And it might not be long before it the window kind of increasingly closes in and it's harder to enter. Um, and I also just think the way, the way esports has been directed in the last couple of years with like franchises and stuff. I don't, I don't think that's going to continue either. I think it's probably going to lean more towards decentralized. Like there's, there's not going to be local esports. maybe collegiate. I think collegiate will probably yeah. become a bigger thing. Um, but that's like the closest you'll get probably. I don't believe in local esports. So, right. Yeah. I mean, that's basically where I stand. Okay. So yeah, everyone in the chat, if you're new to esports you know obviously like owen said the past few years there's been for whatever reason some massive change in the attitude and culture in the creative scene and just esports as a whole but uh, if you are new now's the time um obviously if you're here you probably care enough about learning uh how to get involved and stuff like that so you're off to a good start and there's still space is open so we're going to make sure Everyone who's watching these videos uh, can eventually land the job they want in the future, right? That's kind of the whole point of this thing. So, um, yeah, I mean, I feel the same way. And I think for the most part, all of our, I guess, ideas and opinions have aligned pretty much the same for this this uh, entire that's good interview. To hear. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's awesome. I mean, we're kind of moving into the end. So I have one mm -hmm. question left. The last question, what is the most important piece of advice you'd give to newer creatives looking to make their way into the full-time esports scene? Um, to be honest, I guess it's probably try to emulate people who are genuinely successful and not people who have Twitter success. And that seems like a weird piece of advice mm -hmm. uh, because in the minds of a new designer, those things are one and the same. 
Like a designer who is successful in their career must also have like some kind of social media success. And that's just mm -hmm. not the case as a designer. Um, specifically a designer in esports. Maybe if you're talking about inside the industry, it might be different. I'm not sure. But in esports, the people who you might think are the most successful, like there are certain people in the scene that'll have like 30K followers and you know, they have good, even like good Behance engagement, um, which is certainly nothing to scoff at. But at the same time, like their sources of income are pretty much non-existent. Like it, it really, you got to make sure you're, you're taking advice from the right people and you cannot, it's super easy to take a look at esports design and say, okay, this is not lucrative at all. Like these, there's mm -hmm. these people with, 30k Twitter followers that only make like a thousand dollars a month and to some designers that's like whoa a thousand dollars you know and I get that you know I was I was an, an eighth grader in esports once too that was unfathomable to me and I, I get it that's awesome but when you're talking about working full-time that's not gonna cut it man you can't make a thousand dollars and live off that mm -hmm. uh, so we got to think bigger we got to have higher standards for ourselves um yeah. and the good news is that uh that's happened it's just not obvious so those those people who have crazy social success aren't necessarily the the breadwinners of the community like most almost every esports creative director is they don't have a very large presence on twitter i can think of a handful that do uh, but for the most part the vast majority of their operations is like totally behind the scenes it's all like it's it's localized to their resume their organization all of that it's not like a big public affair they're not posting twitter headers um they're they're focusing on what a company wants to see um and that's really the difference between people who look like they're successful and people who are successful is that one posts what twitter wants and the other does what businesses want. It's really about providing value for a business and it's easy to get sidetracked and like try and farm likes and retweets and followers and stuff. But at the end of the day, that's not gonna get you anywhere. Um, particularly in the case of an esports designer. If you're an influencer or something, that's a different story, you know? If you're like a player <laughs> or a content creator, like obviously that's gonna matter. But if you're a designer, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, like I know people who you wouldn't suspect, people with like, couple thousand twitter followers and they'll get like three likes on a tweet okay and they're they're making like five figures a month all right like lots and lots of money mm -hmm. as a designer and um it's it's to the point where they're 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 not even particularly qualified they're young but they're making way more money than you would imagine i'm not saying i don't want to make it sound like money is the the pinnacle of success or anything but to some degree money does correlate with your career success you know and I, I don't think that's an entirely controversial statement to make the higher up of a position you are the more money you'll be making and that making more money is indicative of being more successful mm -hmm. um so just get advice from people that know what they're doing right. <laughs> and that's not immediately clear but if they're if they're genuinely experienced if the resume is good um they know what they're talking about. Listen to them. Do not listen to the guy making Twitter banners. Right. Even if they get 2,000 likes, you you need you need to listen to the guy who's experienced. And there's nothing wrong with wanting Twitter cloud, of course. I mean, it's cool, um, but you know, like it's not. It doesn't mean anything. You're gonna that that the high of getting those likes is gonna wear off pretty fucking quick when you have $500 a month coming into your bank account. You know. That's not going to be, you're not going to be like, oh man, I'm so cool and Twitter famous when you're living in an $800 apartment. Right. And there's no shame in that, but like, obviously no one wants to be in that position. And I, I people are almost too proud to admit that they want money or they like money. And it's fine, guys. It's fine. Like it, it's okay to be honest with yourself and to, to say, I want money. Like that's all right. And you can do that. It's just a matter of being honest with yourself. You need money to live. So go get it, you know? Uh, Twitter likes don't mean anything. Yeah. And that's like a tough pill to swallow. But I really 
do firmly believe that you can i i don't want to discredit twitter either though because twitter has made my career in many ways um but you cannot get too focused on it yeah and i know this is uh another strong opinion of yours so i know some people mm -hmm. agree some people will probably disagree i mean the idea of social media relevancy has always kind of been polar opposites right um but i guess to kind of follow up and then we'll end on this is how if people who are like you say successful and don't have a large following uh, how do you re recommend that people find them and also do you have a few names you want to shout out uh, for people you see that are kind of fitting under that category yeah so i mean i guess the most obvious way is to just like think of your favorite org and then find their creative director and then like mm -hmm. check their linkedin or something you know like that'll just give you an idea of the the path they took and from there it's kind of just self-evident mm -hmm. um like i know liquid has damien um dignitas has typo mm -hmm. um like just just ask those guys like they're in the they're like the kings of the castle you know mm -hmm. like they're they're in the positions that people dream of getting and they're not they're not extraordinary people they're just dedicated like they're they're disciplined and that's what it comes down to you know they they speak the language of the esports world and they can do their job reliably um and they you know they did the slow and steady wins the race approach and it worked out for them uh they didn't none of those people none of those people mm -hmm. have spent their time farming twitter likes zero like if i went to typo and said what's your most liked post it would literally probably be like like 50 likes i don't know like typo is not a twitter guy yeah you know yeah and um like honestly that's what it comes down to uh you just do not judge people's success by twitter follower count judge their success by resume i guess that's as simple as i can put it mm -hmm. um it's very easy to be tricked into believing that someone is successful on social media. Uh, but if the resume doesn't reflect that, then odds are they just aren't. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, definitely shout out to Typo because that man is a sleeper agent. So much talent. And I mean, he's, yes. he's a boomer, so he doesn't use Twitter at all. So um, it's the same for a lot of people at 100 Thieves. A lot of people, internal staff, they don't even have a Twitter um or they just made one and they're just like super um you know people can't find them people don't know who they are on social media but that has nothing to do with the quality of their work or what they're capable mm -hmm. of i mean i think 100 thieves kind of speaks for itself in that sense right so yeah yeah i mean love that answer um right there now there is one person i want to shout out oh let's actually. go let's let's go that's a uh, kevin avigard uh i don't know if oh, i pronounce yeah. his name right he's a very uh very aggressively swedish man um he's creative director at og right now but he previously was creative director at eg mm -hmm. and uh, i worked under him and he was fantastic he was like the best boss i've ever had unfortunately he's no longer at eg mm -hmm. um but shout out to that guy that's an example of someone you want to emulate. You know, it's it's all about technical skills like leadership and that kind of stuff. And mm. he definitely has it. Um, so all right. anyway. Perfect. Shout out Kevin. Yeah, all right. Kevin. Yeah. All right. You heard it, guys. Thank you guys again. And I will see you next week. Thank you for watching today's video. If you want to catch one of these streams, I'm live every Saturday at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and alternate between portfolio reviews, interviews, and design lessons. Otherwise, feel free to message me on Twitter at Noac Design. Again, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.